or really take an examination at DEI in tech. Of course, we're looking at it from the big picture, understanding what it takes to really make a culture of belonging, but we also want to look at it from topic to topic. Um, last month, we took a look at job descriptions. Um, we, we had Elisa from Cultured Enough come in and speak to how to make job descriptions be more inclusive. And this month, we're looking at equitable compensation. How can we ensure that the folks that we bring on to our organizations are paid fairly and are paid justly? Um, I won't take too much time more from this, but you know, again, we really encourage folks to utilize the chat, talk as much as possible, talk amongst yourself and know that this is, um, if you're just joining us today, this is step one for what's gonna be a, a long road and a really engaging connection. Um, so if you don't mind scrolling down a little bit, I'll speak a little bit to the most diverse tech hub. Um, this is made in partnership with the city of Philadelphia's Department of Commerce. We are one of a few incredible partners who have a couple of different initiatives um, to really take look at the city and figure out a way that we can just make it even more diverse, even more inclusive, and and an even better like um, place for belonging. Um, with that, um, I'll encourage you to check out Technically's website. We've produced a couple of articles on the topic, but I just wanna bring it over to our host for today, Crystal and Jess. Um, Crystal and Jess, take it away. We're so excited to hear everything you have to say mm -hmm. today. There we go. Thank you so much, Deborah. Um, we're really excited to do this. This is a topic that Crystal and I have talked with each other about for a long, long time. So we're excited to get to bring some of what we've learned and some of the questions that we still ask and struggle with. Um, uh, so just by way of quick introduction, um, I'm Jess Gartner. I'm the CEO of AlloView. We're an education finance company in Baltimore. We are about nine years old and about 35 employees today. Um, we have been working on moving towards pay equity and transparency in some way, shape and form really since our founding, although that's evolved over time and we've still got sights on where we wanna take things from today. And I am Crystal. I currently am the chief of staff at Urban Teachers. We aren't actually all that much older than all of you. So we're about 12 years old. Um, our staff is about 150 um, and growing as we increase our regions um, where we operate. Um, and, you know, pay equity is something that I think is very personal to me. I sit at a couple of um, uh, different identities that are typically historically underpaid. And so uh, it is something that I seek to improve in whatever space that I'm in. Um, don't have all the answers, but have a lot of lessons learned. And I'm excited to dig in a little bit with you all today. Yeah, I want to echo that piece about don't have all the answers. Um, actually, I, one of my favorite phrases I learned from Crystal, which is that a lot of DEI work is like hygiene, which is that you should keep doing it. It's not, it's not a one and done thing. Um, I, I would not call myself an expert on this front, but it is something I've, that we've put a lot of work into. And I very much believe in learning in public because a lot of this work is really hard. It's really messy. It's scary if you have not done it before. And I think it's really important to hear from people who are in the thick of doing it so that we can learn together and be better together. Okay, Deborah, I think you have um, a quick poll queued if we could if we could get that started here for folks. So if you could just take a quick minute um, and respond to the poll that Deborah posted, just so we could get a little bit of information about who is joining today. If 
you're just joining, Deborah has also posted a link to a worksheet in the chat that we will be working off of today that you're welcome to make a copy of, take notes on, um, you know, jot down some things that you want to follow up on, additional questions that you have. Okay, so it looks like this is great. It looks like more than half of you are either chief people leaders, CEOs, or COOs. Um, definitely more than half of you if we add in the CFO. So a lot of folks who are in positions who can be making organization wide changes, which is awesome. Okay, pretty even split between kind of medium and larger companies. Okay, and we've got a lot of folks on today who are in positions to make organization wide changes, which is awesome. Very good. Crystal, do you want to talk about uh, some of the objectives and framing for today? Absolutely. Um, so we are really interested in exploring beliefs about compensation because unless you've you've sort of done a little bit of that, especially for those of you who are, who are empowered to make some of these decisions, inevitably some of your own beliefs sneak into what you create. So really acknowledging what sort of undergirds your thoughts about compensation, what you have been taught about it so that you can um, actively seek to address that. Um, and in some cases, even combat that as you uh, begin the process of developing a plan. Um, we wanna talk a little bit about the priorities that we considered for process and structure as we embarked on this process from sort of very different starting points and then minding the gap. So inevitably, as you get into this work, you're going to have your ideal and what is currently happening. And we wanna talk a little bit about what are some things um, that you can keep in mind as you're trying to bridge that gap between your ideal and your reality. So beliefs about compensation, um, I can tell you that I grew up in a family where I was incredibly informed about money, almost too informed. I knew exactly what my mother made. I knew exactly um, what bills were due and when. And so um, I found it very jarring, actually, <laughs> joining sort of I think like professional Western culture, my family is Caribbean, very direct, where talking about money in many of the initial um, positions that I held was still seen as sort of impolite or um, unprofessional even, and grateful that um, some of that has changed. But I still think uh, some of my beliefs, early beliefs as a, a young professional were um, undone by uh, some of the just culture around me where I learned that um, compensation was private um, and uh, truly not something to be discussed, shared, and be careful to, you know, negotiating um, lest you seem um, too entitled. So those are some of my early beliefs about compensation. Um, that I kept in mind as a leader in being able to create a system for an organization. I had the exact opposite experience of Crystal growing up. I grew up definitely with that taboo sense that you don't talk about what you make, that it's impolite, it's rude to ask, it's rude to tell. Um, it's you know seen as like gauche if you talk about your salary and compensation. Um, so I very much grew up with that mindset that this was something that you didn't talk about. Um, grew up with that sense of, you know, negotiating is, is part, of, part of how this works. It comes with the territory of being an adult, getting a job. 
Um, something that is also slightly related to this and, and speaks to some other components of, of hiring and, um, and job descriptions and things like that. I also very much grew up being taught that compensation or worth would be tied to your credentials. And a big part of that would be where you went to school and how good of a school you went to. And that also was pretty tightly tied with some of my thinking about some of my early thinking about compensation and how people might be considered for a job and what we might look for and who we might need to compensate more highly than others. And so I would say I had a very steep learning curve and a lot of unlearning to do. Um, and the more that I have learned about the disparities that can exist by keeping some of these hidden, the more that I was compelled to make a difference as a leader of an organization and do things differently. But there was definitely a period where a lot of that felt very uncomfortable to me. And I was also surrounded by people who thought that that was crazy and just thought it was an absolutely catastrophic thing to do as a leader. I still get that pushback sometimes. People still, even, you know, even though we've been doing this for several years and it's, it's starting to get more social cachet as a business practice, I still get a lot of pushback around on it. So, you know, to echo Crystal's earlier point, I think it's really important to be honest about where some of your personal beliefs and mindsets might come from, even as early as five, six, seven years old, um, and knowing that that might impact some of your thinking or some of the conversations that you have with your executive team or even other employees um, as you as you start to think about and put this work into practice. Thanks for sharing that, Jess. Um, and I think this work is inevitably vulnerable if you're doing it the right way. Um, so we want you to take a moment to consider these questions um, and reflect. What were you taught about money and compensation growing up? Even if you believe something different than what you thought growing up, still name it. Write down what it is that you were taught about money and compensation growing up. Consider what worries you about pay transparency, if anything. And then what excites you about exploring compensation transparency? And we will give you a minute and a half to think through these things and feel free to um, share in the chat if you feel so moved. Also feel free not to if that feels uncomfortable. Crystal and I are both former teachers, so we respect that people have different ways of processing information. So if you want to speak up and join the conversation, if you want to keep your thoughts to yourself, write them down, do whatever you need to do to take this time to process and reflect.
Okay, so that was just about 90 seconds. I already see a few people engaging in the chat. Um, feel free to continue doing that, but this is mostly for you. Um, so take more time to consider these questions um, on your own. In terms of priorities for process and structure, we want to give you a little flavor of this today um, and some starting places, but of course, this is not going to be exhaustive. This will probably be a months or years long process in your organization. Um, before we go into some of the specific steps and questions around this, I will share a little bit about the process that we took at All of You, which Crystal was actually a large part of because she was our director of talent for several years. Um, we initially started doing this work among the executive leadership team. So we started doing research around um, norming job titles, norming salaries across those titles, having conversation about what things look like from department to department, what things look like in terms of market rate and where we wanted to be in terms of competitiveness with the with the tech market with the Baltimore market, which are often very different markets for compensation and um, we really started sort of piloting what we wanted to do behind the scenes, I will say one thing that crystal helped call out for us really early on that was that was a really pivotal point of doing this work was the importance of norming job titles. The, the tech industry in particular has this very weird habit of inventing weird creative names for jobs that don't mean anything and are very hard to benchmark. I now think that's somewhat intentional. <laughs> um, but, you know, if you've ever seen the like, we need a data ninja or like a code rock star like that's not a job that's not something you can easily benchmark or compare or normalize so one of the first things that we did was actually start to think about how we could level and norm titles across departments so uh, that a senior title in the product department meant the same thing as a senior title in design or sales or customer success. And on the one hand, it's very boring, right? Our job titles became very boring, but on the flip side, it's a lot easier for both candidates and your organization to benchmark what those jobs actually are and what they mean in the labor market. So if um, I, I personally want to call that out as something that was really important in the early stages for us to think about what those job titles actually were and how we could map them to things that were easy to search, compare and benchmark in the labor market and in databases about compensation. So, um, you know, coming from all of you, which is a young new company when I worked there and um, moving into uh, urban teachers, which is more of a middle stage, you know, I'd say getting out of infancy and toddlerhood into, you know, teenage development of an organization. Um, I, I entered a space where surprisingly there were, there was very little title um, consistency. There was little job description consistency, even of those ultimately doing the same work. Um, and there was a, a ton of opaqueness around pay, no existing structure at all. Um, basically a hiring manager would maybe check LinkedIn, maybe not, <laughs> and um, or Glassdoor and find what they thought was com com comparative in the market by looking at job title um, and not even doing that second double click of job duties, which is even more important. Um, and then placing sort of a wreck out there. And so I entered an organization that had tremendous pay 
disparity. And um, we really have to start from the ground um, and maybe even below zero because when COVID hit, we also had to do salary reductions. So if you compound reductions on top of pay um, uh, opaqueness and inequity, you get basically a really frustrated, upset and um, righteously angry um, employee base. So for us, um, me understanding where our people were and, and why they were there, I knew that we needed to work with an outside partner in order for folks to even trust the process. And um, learned a lot from that external partner, not hiding the ball. We worked with Agility, known for um, really considering um, equitable pay practices. Um, to help us think through how we would move from a total free-for-all, frankly, into um, a, a pay structure. And some of the things that we had to grapple with were things like specificity versus universality. Um, how like nitty gritty do we get in that first iteration? Is each department sort of having its own decision trees around um, what relevant experience meant, or are we going to be a little bit more uniform? Um, internal equity versus market competition. We know that if you are going just based on the market, you're inheriting all of the bias in market. Um, and uh, specifically around uh, jobs, we know that when mostly women are within a field that that sort of field takes it a pay hit in terms of how well that, that field is valued. So we really wanted to, but, but if when you're hiring, you are competing with other folks hiring. So we had to figure out a comfortable space um, between internal equity and market competition. That was another sort of philosophical tension that we had. Jess, do you wanna keep going? Yeah, just a quick note on the worksheet that you have. Each of these is listed and there's a bar under them. Something that I think is a great exercise to do both for yourselves and maybe with your executive team is to talk about these as a spectrum and maybe plot along that line where you think your organization wants to be on that spectrum. There's gonna be things where you're far to one side, far to the other, somewhere in the middle. Um, because a lot of a lot of the part of this process is defining your philosophies around compensation structure, because there are there are there's no one right way to build a compensation structure. There's plenty of really wrong ways, but there's there really isn't a one size fits all approach. And some of it does have to do with where you are as an organization, what industry you're in, how much external funding or not you have, where you might, you know, you might have a, a wider range of opportunities, whether your organization has um, non non cash compensation as part of your model, like extra benefits or equity. So having these conversations um, as a leadership team in terms of what are, you know, regardless of what some of your original mindsets might have been around compensation, what's sort of your ideal philosophy and framework, and that will help guide the other steps in your process when it comes to the more tactical components. And also, these don't have to be um, these don't have to be forever either. And so I'll, I'll give you an example with the specificity versus universality. Um, I will show you an example in a little while of what Aloeview's matrix looks like today. And when we first shared out this matrix, I think we were about 20 people. Um, the executive team and department heads, and honestly, really me in a lot of cases, were making almost all hiring and offer decisions. So there was not a huge need for overly engineering standardization because that calculus was sort of in my head. And I could know that like if I was involved in every process, I could sort of norm that as we went. Um, so taking taking the time to be like overly engineered on specificity was much less important at that time 
than getting sort of a broad structure in place for pay levels and, and compensation. Um, it was also a time where it was really rare if we had more than one person in any one job. So even creating some of the um, internal equity from like one person to another in the exact same position, like really wasn't an issue yet. Um, Cause even in the rare instances where we might've had two people in the same job, they were likely much more junior roles and they were probably coming in at the same time at the same level. Um, now, as we're growing, the company is scaling. There are more people involved in the hiring process. I am not making the final call on all offers and decisions, which means that we need to add a little bit more specificity and standardization as it relates to questions like how we make an individual offer to the extent that we negotiate or not, how we come up with that number, how would we move somebody within or between those pay bands. And so as we're growing and scaling and we have more managers and more hierarchy, it's starting to become more important for us to put a little bit more time into adding some more specificity to the model. But when we were 20 people, it was more important to have something that was fairly broad and universal. So Jess is talking a little bit about like size of organization as one proxy for kind of thinking through that might impact the way that you think about specificity and universality. I'd also suggest that your current pay practices may also um, have some uh, that that might be something to consider as well. Um, so for us, because our compensation was truly a bit of a free for all, and we were not small, um, we really had to create something that was going to be well understood um, and fairly simple initially um, for our, our employees. That's what they craved. Um, and in fact, we really had to work hard against a tide of equal and versus equity um, um, and sameness versus equity. And so really had to, um, even though we were a bit larger, consider a bit of universality because that is philosophically what most of our organization needed and wanted at the time. I believe that in time, um, the, as we're like, we've rapidly regained a ton of trust through this process. And as that continues to happen, the organization can um, start to embark on some specificity where it matters. Um, but size and also just the, philo the philosophy of your organization and also where you currently are because you're gonna have to manage a change process might also um, be things to consider as you're thinking about specific, specificity versus universality. Um, I wanted to also just like call quick attention to um, two parts market. So where you fall in terms of um, market competitiveness, um, Urban Teachers targeted the 50th percentile prior to our compensation study, we were around the 40th percentile. And this was important to me to get to the 50th or above because we philosophically decided against any negotiation at all. And um, it's a stance that I like to preach about. It is widely understood that negotiation causes tremendous harm for um, specifically women and people of color and especially women of color. And so um, we do away with it and it becomes much easier to do away with negotiation when you're paying towards the top of the market or at least at market. Um, and then in terms of individual versus team, this is again a philosophical question where again, there are many right answers and many wrong ones. So just make sure that um, there's a rhyme and reason behind what you think, but in terms of individual versus team, some organizations prefer individual performance to have a, a, a part in particularly how folks move through and advance through a pay structure and others prefer a team model, how a team performs um, to sort of uh, as a criteria for how folks advance through a structure. So these are just 
priorities and um, things to really grapple with philosophically. Um, I encourage you not to just do this on your own and plot on your own um, spectrum or line graph, but have these critical and crucial conversations with others. It will unearth, again, more of those mindsets and more of the thinking um, that you'll need to get on the table in order to build a structure that um, makes sense. I also want to double click on something that you mentioned, Crystal, about the internal equity versus market competition. So as you are thinking, and this kind of goes with that market percentile piece, there's there's some overlap in this conversation. Part of your equity audit and your compensation audit might be seeing where your staff is today compared to market rates. But I cannot stress enough that there are deep inequities baked into those market rates. And I think it is very important to remember that market rate does not mean gold standard. And so you will likely see that there are disparities in the market rates because we know that these pay equities persist. And I have a, a particular challenge with that as a tech company because in the tech industry, developers are treated almost like gods among men in many circles, especially in certain regions of the country. And so you will have to make a decision. Do you want to compete with Facebook and Apple and Google on engineering talent and pay software developers 10 times what somebody in another department might be making or are you going to say no actually we want to normalize our pay scales across departments and roles um, in a much closer way which may mean that your market competition for some roles might look different than they do for others so it might not be your goal to be in the 75th percentile for every role. Now on the flip side of that, there are also many roles that I believe are dramatically underpaid. There are roles where people are not making a living wage, also not something we're trying to replicate. So I've been very clear for a long time at Alloview that if we do market comparisons, it is likely that it will confirm what I know to be true, which is that our floor is probably higher. We do not hire anybody really below median national income and our ceiling is lower. We are not paying people half a million dollar salaries. We're not competing. Yeah, if you want to go work for Apple and make a half a million dollars, go for it. Like we're not the we're not the place for you. That's a conscious decision you have to make and you have to think about how that philosophy plays out in your structure. And you also think about, have to think about what you will do when your top candidate comes to you and says, Jess, your salary max is out at 150, but I have an offer in hand for 350 at this cool Silicon Valley company. If you make an exception, you don't have a compensation structure. So you have to really decide now what your philosophy on those things are and how you will handle them and what your justification is for that. Crystal, anything else that you wanna add on there? On these no, things? just well said on the difference between market um, and gold standard, I, I, if there's one thing you take away from the slide, let it be that. Um, you are not aiming to replicate the market. It is not a great place. <laughs> um, and consider, especially in tech, who predominantly are your developers, um, what gender and racial background they are, and consider whether a tremendous um, pay gap between a senior developer and a senior customer success person um, at that degree is, is equitable, um, even if the market is saying um, it is. So. The other thing it reminds me of is like all of the uh, 
artificial intelligence algorithms that are supposed to like vet like uh, applications and resumes. But if they're if those algorithms are all written by white men, then like those the, the computers and the algorithms are only as smart and unbiased as the people writing them. Right. So it's like if you have to be careful what you're comparing to. If you're comparing to something that is biased and inequitable, your structure will be biased and inequitable. Um, before we move on there, are there any questions about any of these? If folks want to pop into the chat or, or raise your hand and, and speak up if you had any, any questions or thoughts on any of these spectrums and, and how, how you might think about them with your teams. So one more thought, I know we're moving on, but we did not add this to the slide, but it was really important. Just mentioned that at all of you, the floor is a bit higher and the ceiling likely lower. Um, we did that at Urban Teachers too and intentionally. Um, and something that's really important for us is getting the messaging right around what our philosophy is so that when we get a candidate who knows they can make $40,000 more elsewhere, but who is like really tapped into our mission and our values, they, they're excited about a choice that they're making. Um, but we, we too have a ratio between highest and lowest paid that we will never supersede. And we have a wage floor based on MIT's um, living wage calculator. And that goes both ways, Crystal, too, because I know one justification that I've heard from people or one defense against pay transparency is if you're going to say the floor for this role is $60,000, but you get an applicant who's currently making 40 and says they really want to make 45. Well, a true capitalist would say we're wasting $15,000 by offering them 60 when they would have taken 45. But an equitable compensation structure says, you were probably being dramatically underpaid for your skills at $40,000. We have independently decided that the responsibilities and accountability and experiences that we are looking for in this role is a, at least a $60,000 job. And to pay less than that is to exploit your labor force. So if you get pushback from people, maybe your CFO, maybe an investor, maybe a grant maker, aren't you leaving money on the table or aren't you wasting money? If you tell people where the floor is, you can say to them, well, the alternative is that we are exploiting people by paying them for less than we know that they are worth to us. And that will inevitably create pay disparities because the next person who applies for that role is gonna ask for 65. And now you have a $20,000 pay gap for this role that you didn't need to have because you could have just been honest about what the range was for the role. So those are some of the tough things that make that might come up from a financial standpoint. And, you know, look, I, I was a I'm a startup founder. I know what it is like to have two weeks of money in the bank and to feel the pain of like, oh, we need to save every dollar. This is not the place to save the dollars. I promise you. You will sleep better at night. Your company will be healthier. Your employees will be happier. You will have more loyalty and trust and equity on your team if you do right by people and adhere to those structures in both directions. Crystal, do you want to talk about why we pulled um, some of these processes as key decision points that are related to comp structure? Absolutely. So in terms of job description, Jess did a great job of talking about titles and some title symmetry will support and be helpful um, in, the, in this process. But job description, i.e. duties, what is actually happening, um, how much authority to make decisions 
um, i.e. how much responsibility um, the folks in a specific job have, as well as um, whether they're managing folks, if that is something that you've agreed should get paid more, because not everyone will think that. And again, not necessarily a wrong answer there, um, but really sort of norming and getting some symmetry around job descriptions will assist in this process. The job offer we called out um, because this is where an equity often begins. Um, right after the job description, it is within the offer and oftentimes it is around negotiation. So uh, we have a pretty hard line, no negotiation. And initially that had to do with salary. We are now in the process of considering do we have standardized relocation packages? Do we have standardized um, other types of requests that might come alongside a job offer? Because salary is the biggest place where an equity can happen if you allow negotiation, but there are other places where folks can um, sometimes get creative in terms of negotiation and um, really getting clear on what your offerings are, um, salary and other types of transitional packages that you might consider offering um, will support in, in equity. Reviews of performance, team performance, individual performance, the blend of both, whatever it is that you all decide matters to you and your organization and is supportive of your culture. Um, ensuring that you are creating a process that is equitable, creating a process. Um, one of the most equitable things that I believe can happen with a process around reviews is ensuring that um, the review team is more than just the manager. Um, and also ensuring that there is an appeals process or um, something that an employee can do and is empowered with. Um, to request um, a second look at, at their review if needed. And then raises and promotion um, at Urban Teachers. One of the things that we've designed is a promotion window um, process where we look at raises and promotions twice a year. Um, and it aligns with sort of our financial calendar and our what we know our cash flow to be. This was incredibly important to me. My first year at Urban Teachers, I noticed that there is there are a couple of times a year where it seemed really advantageous to ask for promotions and raises where they'd get granted is more easily. And a couple of times a year that you really probably should not ask for those things. And it, and it had to do a little bit around um, our, our cash flow and when we had to reconcile a few things. And so it was really important to me, and I, I thought um, specifically because that's how our organization functioned, to consider raises and promotions um, all at once, a couple of times a year, when we knew that like the primary driver wouldn't be panic over um, some sort of reconciliation, um, and we could really look clear-eyed at all candidates. So those are some places that, um, were really pivotal for me um, and for our organization as we were creating a more equitable landscape. Um, I'm just being mindful of time here. I think I'm going to actually pause here and I will show you guys an example of um, our structure at Alloview. Um, and, you know, bear in mind, this is essentially a living document because it's something that we evaluate and reevaluate at least annually. Um, so the way that our structure works is that we have seven bands of compensation and those bands are title normed across the organization. Um, so our one through three bands are always sort of this advisor or specialist type title and their levels one, two, three. Our, our band four is a senior position. Our band five is a director position. Band six is VP and band seven is a chief or department head. 
we may need to add more bands as we grow. We may need to at some point add an, an SVP or um, you know, a level four in here before you get to senior. But right now, this was sort of the good balance for us at our size under 50 people, having enough hierarchy that allowed us for us to be specific enough in job descriptions and titles, but not like so overwhelming and onerous that like every single person in the company had a different band. Um, the steps right now we have a min and a max range for the job and we keep them pretty tight especially at the lower levels at the higher levels they do get a little bit broader up to a you know a 40 or fifty thousand dollar range for the very senior titles because there can really be a very different breadth of experience in the in the most senior roles of the company um so I'll, and then we also have sort of indicated if this role is manager um, eligible. So in our company right now, you have to be band four or above to be eligible to be a manager. That doesn't necessarily mean you're a manager, but we we're not going to make somebody who's band two a manager. Um, so I'll talk about a couple of things that have, have worked well for us on this and some things that we want to change. Um, one, it's really nice having the titles consistent across departments. That's very helpful because there's sort of a an, now an organizational knowledge of like, okay, a senior it just means the same thing in terms of level of responsibility and experience across the company. Um, I think this has been the right number of bands for us. We also align these bands to our stock option allocations. We do not negotiate stock options and they do not differentiate by department. So let's just say, you know, if you're band two, you get 10,000 stock options, no matter what your role is in any department, that's your stock option allocation. There's no negotiation on it. Um, some things that we want to improve in terms of like moving towards more specificity as we grow, I want to tighten up what a starting offer means. Um, so right now when we post a job description, we'll post this whole range. So if I'm posting for a senior account advisor, we'll post 100 to 150. The reality is though, I'm not going to hire somebody at $150,000 starting salary for that role. We usually target the middle of the band. And so it's starting to occur to me like, well, why should we, why pace the whole range if really we're looking for the, the beginning or middle of that band for a starting offer? Um, we're starting to have some conversations like that. We make a few exceptions. But the reality is if you're really close to the top of that band, I have to wonder if you maybe shouldn't be at a band five position and, and starting. So we're starting to have some conversations about what does it make sense to post in terms of setting expectations for a starting offer? And how do we determine what that offer is with more standardization? So how do we place people within that band for a starting offer? Um, right now, it's a it's a conversation in terms of like, here's what this person's skills and experience looks like. And I have that conversation with the hiring manager, but when I'm not going to be having that conversation, there needs to be a set of rules for it, right? We have to be able to scale that logic. We're also having conversations um, in terms of how we move people across and between these. Again, right now, it's a pretty it's it's pretty much a qualitative discussion amongst the leadership team. But as we start decentralizing that type of authority to managers who are non executive positions, we need to have more well defined rules for how people move between and across bands. So those are some things that we're currently exploring for tightening this up, um, maybe giving it a little bit more definition. But again, at 50 people, I don't need like a Google level decision tree for like, you, you know, you have to answer 50 questions to decide what somebody's starting salary is. So it's again, sort of figuring out like, okay, what's gonna be the right level of specificity to take us to 70 or 100 hires? I will quickly share just how um, 
how urban teachers is a little bit different. So we currently have, and I'll send if possible um, to Deborah uh, a snapshot, but for time's sake, I won't go into it. Um, we have sort of made it very clear, like in our offer letter, the salary that is listed is what will be offered, period. Um, we do have a geographic differential. We have um, five possible differentials that we apply based on what um, cost of labor of where the person um, we are bringing on is located. And so we, sh we share that, that here is the salary subject to a cost of labor um, differential depending on where uh, the candidate lives. We also have sort of specified almost steps um, so you know exactly what you'll make if you get a raise. <laughs> um, we know we, we've made it that clear. And part of that is because I would say almost 70%, if not more, of our staff are former teachers and former educators. And so again, the appetite for a little bit more of a regimented system is there. Um, and that is a, a, something that provided some psychological safety for a lot of our staff. And so um, not fighting against that tide, but I know that that wouldn't work everywhere. However, the part that I do recommend is exactly what Jess said, tightening up where that initial offer lands and um, getting really clear by how much folks can um, jump uh, in each sort of cycle of either pay review or performance review. I wanted to address Elena's question around communicating and um, as you can imagine, there is no one size fits all. Um, you may be in a better spot than Urban Teachers was when I started this um, at UT. And if so, your communication will be different than it was um, with Urban Teachers. But what I will say is this whole process requires a real change management plan, particularly if you're in a larger organization, you need to assess sort of where um, inequities are and, and how bad they and persisting they are, and then really um, backwards plan from consideration of how uh, different demographic, demographics and um, factions within your organization will be impacted. We leaned heavily on um, broad communication of process broad communication of findings from our compensation structure, but a couple of things. We did not share negative findings um, before also having the solution to those negative findings. We made sure that we did both of those at the same time. We found this, here's what's happening and by when. Um, we also made sure that process and structure and information was shared broadly, but individuals were communicated with one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and we felt that that was also really important. People wanted individualized attention. So hope that helps in terms of a few quick tips um, on communicating. So Deborah has um, a quick ending survey that she's gonna post. And while you guys are filling that out, um, Crystal and I will just kind of continue this. I mean, that conversation is a great segue to this um, comparison piece, which is that some of the hardest parts about this will be discovering where you are and how far you might be from where you want to be and that might be it might be a one-off situation right you might have one if you're small you might have one or two employees uh that you need to bump up and and it's a quick and everybody's happy to get more money and then everybody's happy and it's a problem solved if you're a hundred people or 200 people you might have disparities that add up to $10 million. And then you have to make a really hard call about how you're gonna fix that. If you can fix that, do you, does your budget actually allow for you to keep this staff at the levels where they need to be from an equity standpoint? So I completely agree with Crystal that thinking through these things and doing this in stages 
Um, you never, ever want to be like, hey, guys, guess what? We found out that 20% of you are being dramatically underpaid without a full plan for how you're going to address that. So you really need to have a plan and a timeline for doing this in stages. You might need to get early buy-in from your board to make significant compensation changes or title changes if and when warranted. And I don't want to... Oh, I don't want to understate the emotional weight of that. I, I don't think any of you became organizational leaders to intentionally screw over people and exploit them. And some of the results of this might make me feel like a bad person. You might be like, how did I let that happen? That was happening under my nose. I, I helped perpetuate pay inequity in my organization. And the absolute worst thing you can do is try to rationalize what happened because you feel bad. So really sitting with any weight that you feel as you kind of discover discrepancies and putting them down, put that weight down in as much as it helps you to look clear eyed um, to create a plan forward. And I would say, especially if you are a white leader or a male leader and you find discrepancies between gender and race in your organization, you need to work really hard to decenter yourself and decenter your feelings from that process. These conversations cannot be about your employees making you feel better about it. So these are really tough conversations to have. They're tough facts and realities to confront. I really hope you do it. I hope you do the work. It's hard, but on the other side of this, having a more equitable and transparent organization is really worth it. I think we have like maybe one final slide if you wanna to go to the last one. And that is um, just really want you to think before you hop off, if you can, what is one commitment that you can make to advance pay equity at your company or organization? If you sit in the seat of a leader or someone who is empowered to make these changes, what is a commitment? And that's different than the second question, which is what is your first step? So a commitment is something that you can come back to that should ground you through the process that can be a bit grueling. And you might do this like big and great thing and discover that it actually almost feels worse than just status quo for a minute of having not kicked up all this dust. What is the commitment that you can come back to that will keep you going? And then what is your first step? What's the first thing that you will do um, on the pathway toward realizing your commitment? And that's it. Hopefully for some of you attending today, maybe was your first step. So think about your second step. And we're really glad that you all took some time with us today. Um, this is super important work and I'm excited to see you all thinking about it and asking these questions. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Jess and Crystal. This has been so incredible. Um, thank you to everyone who was able to attend today. We know that this is a lot of information. Um, yes, we can email it to you, just looking at the chat. Um, if you have any last minute questions, feel free to drop them in the chat, but we'll be emailing you the presentation as well as the worksheet. We're so grateful for you guys um, to all attend today. Um, if you have any questions about the uh, about anything, please let me know. Um, and also, yeah, we'll be in touch soon. We've already chosen the date for our next workshop, um, which is going to focus on the ethics of brand marketing when it comes to diversity. And that will be June 29th. Um, typically, these workshops are on the last Wednesday of every month, but we really appreciate Jess and Crystal and their flexibility so that we could do this workshop during Philly Tech Week. Um, I hope everyone has a wonderful day and we'll talk soon.